Well, Russia backed out of nuclear arms talks with the U.S. for now. The State Department announced Monday that Moscow, quote, unilaterally postponed resuming discussions under the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, also known as START, which is an arms control pact that curbs both nations' stockpiles of nuclear weapons. Talks will now be set for next week. Meanwhile, the U.S. is contemplating supplying Ukraine with additional weapons, more specifically, cheap, small pre precision bombs for Kyiv to use in its rockets. According to Reuters, Boeing is said to be developing these small type weapons that would go to Ukraine to beef up its arsenal. Now, th this is kind of interesting because I was reading that Ukraine is actually agitating for more long range missiles. And there is some <laughs> restraint being exercised by the U.S. government right now because they, their fear is that that will provoke an escalation yeah. that, frankly, Ukraine cannot defend. At the same time that we're experiencing um, our own reserves being diminished, they are the, the, the kind of the interests at play are obvious here when you see how it's, it's causing there to be a ramping up of production at the, the Lockheed Martin plant in Alabama that Joe Biden visited last year, and on and on and on, all the critiques that we've made about how much money the U.S. is spending on this conflict. But it is interesting to see that there does seem to be this pattern of the Biden campaign showing more restraint than the war hawks in the media who are kind of backing all of Zelensky's calls for whatever kind of weaponry that he demands, no matter what the implications are for ultimate peace settlements. Yeah, that's a good point. It's fair enough. It, we've been very, very very critical of the Biden administration throughout this conflict. But it is true that if, if many in the media got their way, no fly be zone. the no-fly zone yeah. being the best example of that. You the, know, why aren't you Russians doing more? Are we doing Poland enough? Poland yeah, yeah. The fiasco. Yeah, yeah so it's, uh, it is good to know that there are some limits to what they're willing to do, and that makes perfect sense, especially if we're saying, right, this is so Ukraine can defend itself, not so we can have World War III, then, right, it's just weapons that can actually defend yeah. the territory they're trying to defend rather than, you know, as, as a <laughs> precursor to some actual ground invasion of Russia. Uh, the nuclear, the talks being delayed is not good, although I, if they're just delayed till next week, fine. But uh, we want to have, it's, we want the U.S. and Russia and other nuclear capable nations yeah. to be in constant dialogue about ramping down or, or keep, keeping at bay the forces who want to unleash the end of the planet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it does feel that the way that the postponed nuclear talks have been covered do have an air of America's being so reasonable, uh, Russia wants to keep all of its nukes because it wants to do a nuclear war. They're the ones that we should be afraid of. Um, and as I mentioned in my radar last week, there is just one country that's ever actually deployed nuclear weapons, and it's the one that we're sitting in and broadcasting from right now. Yep. Um, so we'll see what happens. Ultimately, obviously, if there is some real desire to get out of these nuclear uh, disarmament conversations, then we'll, we can revise. But, you know, I, I also was speaking to a nuclear expert who I've since uh, fallen out with a little bit, but Joe Cerenzioni earlier this year was pointing to how um, different the posture is now than it was in the 90s, where nuclear um, disarmament was such a big part of the conversation and the political conversation. And folks are really pushing for it in a kind of um, both global and kind of bipartisan manner. And there just doesn't seem to have been the mm. appetite for that since the Obama My era. understanding is that many countries actually are lesser, or countries that have their defenses basically covered by the U.S. Right. or by Russia, I guess, uh, want to uh, take get rid of their nuclear arsenals because they're costly to maintain. Right. And, you know, what's the point if, like... Well, now Ukraine is maybe arguably having some regrets about choosing Well, right. To. So then the regret you have is if you needed them when you get invaded. But so many, like France, right, doesn't expect to be. If France was invaded, the U.S. would come to the rescue. The cavalry would ride in on their nuclear <laughs> torpedoes, and that right. would be that. But, uh, but it, you can save money and actually get rid of them if you're... Yeah, and I think that the goal that is that if France were invaded, if nobody had any nuclear weapons, then America coming to their defense wouldn't necessarily mean nuclear holocaust. It would mean. Well, if nobody had nuclear weapons, including America right. and the people invading France, right? There would be. I mean, which well, used to be the goal, but doesn't even seem to be on the horizon at all anymore. Yes, of course, wars were very. Obviously, very, very destructive, very deadly in the pre nuclear. We've never had. Actually, we've never really had. We've had, never had war with nuclear. We've had the U.S. using nuclear weapons in that one case, but not against a power that also had nuclear weapons. We've never had a scenario where two nuclear-ready uh, countries go to war and use their nuclear weapons, which yeah, we all both, think would both, be very both, catastrophic. Both parties are fighting for it, so never say never. Russia's invasion, however, has stoked anti-war sentiments among some in Russia. Activists against the Russia-Ukraine conflict fled their motherland to seek asylum at the U.S. southern border. So they took a trip to Mexico and made their way up. But according to the New York Times, instead of freedom, 
they were met with shackles and put into immigration detention centers. Many of those asylum seekers have actually likened the conditions to those of Russia. Yeah, anti-war activists have been flocking to the U.S. in search of refuge before the war, but the mass exit has since increased. Mm. This story is fascinating to me because at the same time that so many media stories are talking about how terrible the conditions in Russia are, how authoritarian Putin is, not wrongly, and really kind of elevating and celebrating people who are willing to protest and speak out against Russia. We're seeing a similar kind of coverage happening with respect to what's going on in these China protests right now. But when push comes to shove and these immigrants try to find asylum, like we have an asylum mm -hmm. process, not just a normal immigration process, but a process for people who are seeking political refuge. That's the whole point of this country. It's what Lady Liberty is all about, right? They're discovering that a lot of what America's propaganda is globally in terms of being stating that, you know, a country that's welcoming people um, who are fleeing political persecution with open arms is really not the case. And they're getting the treatment that so many immigrants from South and Central America, who often are also political asylees, have been um, receiving, and Haiti as well has been receiving. And it's, it's not a pretty picture. Yeah. It, it seems to me it would make sense to want people to flee Russia in a sapping Russia of, frankly, available bodies, right? The, 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 they're going to throw everybody <laughs> I don't know into they're the going to put a real effort. dent in Russia's uh, Well, manpower. if we could pay, I mean, we, we had a guest on. It might not have been a day you were in the hosting chair. Um, Brian Kaplan, a, an economist I quite like, saying, mm -hmm. I'm more cost, even cost effective. If we're committing massive amounts of money to, in terms of the weapons we're sending, just pay people to defect from mm. the army. Just pay them to <laughs> give up, transfer them out of that part of Europe. Mm. Move that. Yeah, maybe France can take them, uh, and then and you, you actually would sap the military of its mm -hmm. ability to fight. So in some sense, the, the best place. For, for Russians is anywhere but the Russian front where they can be put to military yeah. use. If, we're, if that's what we're actually doing, if, we wanna, if this is a war, we're committed to winning, and we, we're not, we, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna ship, ship tons of weapons, we're gonna spend tons of money, but we're not willing to like tweak or relax our asylum policies for five seconds. You're not really committed to, to winning this yeah, thing. Yeah, and, and also, it, it, it really undermines our humanitarian commitments, the extent to which we always say that the yeah. reason that we're involved in everything is because we care about the children and we care about the women and we care about, you know, the, the horrible authoritarians and what they're doing to folks overseas. For us to be so callous, I mean, it has some echoes of, I mean, it's obviously not commensurate in the least, but there are all these horrible stories of people who are fleeing World War II and the horrors of the Holocaust who got turned away at American shores and had to go back and were ultimately exterminated in a genocide. So, I mean, it it is, yeah. it is, I think, important an important story because it shines a light on why our asylum system is so important and why it's such a problem that it's so un underfunded that all different kinds of folks, some of whom have more or less political merit to their asylum claims, are all bundled together. Certain groups, there's been a lot of coverage on how Ukrainians have been treated very well with respect to other groups, uh, how Haitians don't even get to touch the floor. They're immediately shipped back out of the country on airplanes versus all these other kind of tiers of people as you work your way down. Um, and it really should be about the merit of your political claim and the harm you face elsewhere. And if America wants the reputation that it's seeking through these wars of being a defender of freedom and democracy, it should act like it when refugees yeah. come to our shores. Although well, the bigger issue is we, we we do have to just fix kind of our immigration system. We do. Because we do have an issue where everyone is claiming asylum. Some of these claims are not realistic. Sure, it, but there's not enough people, funding. Right, that's what people are judges doing. Judges to actually it, adjudicate well, the cases. And then, right, and then it's a whole issue. Yeah. We need to make it easier to come, for people to come here legally, so, and then you won't have the situation where yeah. we have so many people coming in that we don't know what to do with that aren't technically supposed to be here, as is the case here, if we just made it easier. That would be better. Yeah, for we, we can agree about that. Tomorrow on Rising, a new report finds that at least 10 people living in Brooklyn's little Pakistan neighborhood were actually appointed to positions within the borough's Democratic Party organization without their knowledge in October. We're going to have two of those new appointees on to discuss. Mm. Wild. Fascinating. Be sure to like, share, share and subscribe so you never miss any content. And for those of you who prefer to listen while on the go, we are now available anywhere you listen to podcasts. I learned over Thanksgiving that my grandmother has figured this out, how to watch us on Roku and other streaming services as well. So exciting. If grandma can do it, grandma anyone can do, can it. do it. You can do it too. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, guys.